Uh, so my name is Elio Byrne and I am a freelance journalist. I am mostly seen in the Evening Echo and the Irish Examiner. Uh, again, big thanks to Mike for having us all here tonight and also very honoured to be on a panel with really tireless advocates for independent music in Ireland and in Cork. So I feel very honoured and I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion later, but uh, I'm a bit of an imposter. I'm not a music journalist, really sorry for that, I don't want to tell you. I am a general arts and culture dog's body, so I write about everything from film to theatre to feature interviews with visual artists. And when I'm very lucky, I do get to write about music as well, but always with an, uh, kind of a, an emphasis for me on the performative. So I don't review albums. I do cover live events from time to time when I'm lucky. Uh, so, but I thought that even bearing that in mind, that I could maybe give you a little insight into the kind of the media angle on what's happening in arts and culture and in music, because uh, I am, as a freelancer, something of a gatekeeper between the editors and what I get pitched. So I get pitched things, I pitch them on, I decide am I going to annoy an editor with something or is he going to be interested in it? So I thought I could give you, give you a little bit of an insight into that. Turn page. <laughs> so I mean, I guess what I do is all about audience. So it's all about deciding who the audience for your writing is. So uh, we're in a, uh, I have an audience. <laughs> so maybe we'll do a quick head count. Who here, you can raise your hands, is a dedicated music fan? Oh yeah, quite a lot. <laughs> Who here is the, either a musician or an aspiring mus musician themselves? Fair enough. Who here works in the admin side of music, something like PR or events management, something like that? Okay, good stuff. Who here is some other type of content producer? Maybe you do words, photos, video, but you collaborate with musicians? Okay, who here is a taxi driver who watches the voice of Ireland. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> because that's who I'm writing for most of the time, realistically. Because what we have in this room is a niche audience for music. I presume you all get news mostly online for your for finding out about what's happening around the place with music. Yeah. So. What, where do you get your information? Hands up, night or night? Hands up, golden plaque? Hands up, state.ie? Or broadsheet.ie? Thin air? Okay. So a lot of you are going to those sources, right? You're going online. How about kind of legacy titles, the times be that online or, yeah? Uh, how about the Evening Echo for Cork Music News? <laughs> okay, now hands up who buys a print copy of a publication to find out about music. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so I guess my point there is that music journalism is one of the niches for whom online was uniquely suited. So multi-platforming is the way to go for music journalism. It's fairly obvious why because music journalists used to have a really terrible job of trying to describe sound with words, which is a really difficult thing to do. Whereas now what they can do is they can embed their audio or their video, or they can rely heavily on beautiful gig photographs, and they can give somebody a multi-platform product. Right? So we see that all the time now. We're really used to it. I think actually Mike's column... I'm <laughs> tracking in your mic, sorry. I can wait with that. <laughs> Mike's column on Broadsheet, you know, the, the You May Like This, is a really good example of that type of multi-platform. Because what he's able to do is he's able to just give five points about the band and then ask you if you like it yourself. You get to experience it. Back in my day, you had to rely on free CD giveaways on the front of the music press if you wanted to actually hear the band and not just read the interviews. So yeah, some of that pressure has been translated into music journalists moving online. It's, it's convenient. What's very exciting and interesting to me is that I think that there's a feedback loop between what the music press are doing and what the bands are doing. So, when I was in my teens and I was growing up in Cork and we went to new gigs to see a new band, it was, you know, three piece, four piece, it was a kit drums, it was 
bass guitar and a male voice, <laughs> almost always a male voice, and uh, they were gazing at their shoes. They just were. There was no emphasis on performance. What's really amazing to see is that there's a new generation of musicians who are really into the multi-platform thing, who are very, very aware of their performance and how they come across this on stage and all those kind of things. I mean, there's people like AMAC who are very, very exciting. There's Melty Brains. They're very, very theatrical. They're very, very visual. And they're aware that not only are they musicians, but they're giving good picture. They're giving good video while they're performing. We could argue that us with that. We could ask, has video finally killed the radio star, I guess? And I suppose there are a lot of people there who might feel maybe that's something that can come up on the panel, I guess. But I don't. I mean, obviously, you can't kind of only say that that's the fault of the music press because, in the with the plurality of what's available online, people's influences are a huge amount broader than they ever used to be as well. But for me, it means that it's very exciting. There's this melding of art forms that you're kind of witnessing, uh, and uh, sorry, turn page. So it means that it is a very exciting time, but it, it's also a postmodern, post-truth, <laughs> bewildering time. <laughs> it's a frustrating time. It's difficult to monetize. It's we have difficulties with our venues. I had this really, really, uh, really demonstrated to me yesterday, when I was reading about twelve million going into the new event centre, and simultaneously got a message that the kino had closed. So to me, that really clearly demonstrates that there is a global kind of a kind of a glossy cultural product that feeds huge industry, that gives us all the sense that we're experiencing culture, versus what most of the people in this room are doing, which is actually being culture makers. So I hope that we're gonna get a chance to talk about that on the panel, because it's something I'm really into at the moment. Finally, I guess, uh, before I go, I'm probably nearly out of time, am I? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to just thank everybody for doing the work they do because it's that, I mean, for starters, you feed me and my children. <laughs> but as well as that, I think it's that sense of kind of community engagement through what we're all doing creatively that is the reason we're all in this room, for starters. And I want to all tell you that if you want to approach me with stories, <laughs> feel free. I really want to work with as many people as possible. But if your headline is, band makes interesting new album, you're going to stay niche. <laughs> if you want to reach the taxi driver, and you want to come to me, and you want to do your own PR because you're DIY and you're on a shoestring, that's totally fine. And you can approach me and you can ask me whatever you want. But the story is going to be the narrative. The story is going to be the backstory. It's going to be the pictures you can provide. And if you want to reach, reach a wider audience, you kind of have to consider doing those things. So I think that's about all for me. Thank you all very much. Woo!